Hello everyone, this is Bradley. Today this is a preset tutorial about proximity fourth, which is kind of key in motion graphics. You can see it in many, many different motion graphics and visual effects. In fact, if you're doing any kind of those, one of the most common techniques to make animation interesting should be this proximity fourth. This fourth may have many other names, such as distance fourth or spherical fourth, or point distance for or whatever. All these names point to the same idea. This is an influence effector that occupies a spherical shape based on the distance. In the past, I have made a fundamental tutorial explaining how to build this node from scratch using either vector mass distance or geometry proximity. Personally, I think the older tutorial is still relevant. In the future, if I have time, I may make a beginner series to discuss this concept again. But honestly, this is a fairly easy concept. And since this is directly provided by Cinema 4D, so users can use it brainlessly, you should do the same. Therefore, presets are free from the link in the description. So here we are in Blender. I want to talk about some new design aspects of this preset. As one of the oldest preset, it has gone through many generations of bug fixes, updates, and changes. This is the current new form of the preset in Blender 5.0. In the past, we had to show all sockets before 4.5. That's why we have both object and geometry input at the same time. But nowadays, we can hide the sockets based on the mode. So we have object input on one mode and the geometry input on the other. The design becomes a bit more professional than before, but you should uh, still see lots of similarities between versions. We still have location offsets, scale offsets, decimal shift, animation factor, and so on and so forth. We are going to discuss the basic usage of it. Here I'm using a simple example of fourth to drive the Z offset of our grid geometry. By default, we have nothing because you're in object mode without an object. Before we add any object to control the fourth, let's play with other settings which can also drive the point. Since we don't have an object to drive the proximity, let's add a scale offset first so we can see it. This scale basically functions as a radius to draw the distance. Fourth is basically a masking gradient from 0 to 1, or 1 to 0. And uh, proximity fourth generates this gradient by proximity or distance to the point. So here, closer to the center, the value is closer to 1, and the farther away, it becomes 0. It's important to note we have decimal shift, which can divide this scale offset by 10 or more. It's important for position when you try to achieve some tiny distance. In addition to scaling the points, you can also move it with the location offset. It's not exposed normally, but you can access it using combine XYZ and move it. One use case is, for example, you can have a quadratic Bezier curve and uh, let's sample curve so you have a position and you can use this position to drive our proximity fourth to offset along its path. Now let's lock the node tree and add our object. It can be any type of object, but uh, it's always great to use an empty object and uh, set it to sphere. Because you will have very good visualization of the desired area of influence. It doesn't work here because previously we touched the scale offset. So we can clear it to zero. Now we have area of influence matching our expectation and you can scale it up or down to see how it changes. But it's important to be aware that uh, sometimes you want proximity fourth at a different distance. And uh, instead of having multiple empties, you can duplicate your proximity fourth and only change the scale offset for a different result. Also, often people have a misconception of the fourth animation. 
For example, they animate proximity fold by scaling down the empty. This is problematic because if you think about it, we are always mapping the distance in the scale of one to zero. As you see, when I shrink the object scale, there's nearly always a center point very prominent and stuck at the value of one. This may not be ideal because closer to the center, the more abrupt animation becomes and the farther from the center, the transition becomes slow. Although it always seems easier to just scale the object to animate it, it's more of a quick result instead of a real professional way to handle it. Alternatively, this is what the animation factor is prepared for. You are expected to scale a static gradient using your object instead of animating the scale of your empty. You should uh, tweak the animation factor from 0 to 1. You can see we no longer have this prominent value of 1 anymore, and everything moves equally at the same rate from 0 to 1. These are the most these are the basic concepts of the most important settings. Of course, ease ease just means ease ease, and turning it off, you are going to have a uh, abrupt linear relationship. Since both is defined in the range between zero to one, you can use float curve to give different mappings as you wish. And if you want to change the scale of the final output, you can use remap zero to one to increase the magnitude or decrease the magnitude. This is beneficial because you can keep using the same four of settings, the same node for different mappings and the different final outputs. Right now we're using an object as a point. So no matter if you use Suzanne or a cube, it will always be evaluated as a sphere from the object origin, similar to what we did with empty. In edit mode, if you move the Suzanne mesh away, because the object origin along with its uh, location transform haven't changed. Alternatively, if you enable geometry mode, at first it will pop up a warning suggesting scale offset must be greater than zero because these vertices by themselves don't have any distance to evaluate. So now let's increase it then you see it starts to evaluate actual polygons or points accordingly. This is also where decimal shift becomes more important for more precise value of your scale offset. Similarly, in geometry mode, you can input the geometry that's created inside the geometry nodes without an external object. Due to the time constraint, I will not discuss advanced settings but you can play with the values yourself to see what they mean. At last, I want to talk about some ideas derived from proximity fall. One important derivative is mesh fall. Normally, proximity fall will not count the volume of a mesh and thus creating a hollow in some cases as shown in this Suzanne example. But the mesh fall does, and you can choose to expand or shrink it it will be better if you play with the values yourself and see. Personally, I usually couple it with a distorted sphere or this kind of uh, ellipse shape or fourth, which is not normally possible in regular proximity. In the future, this node may be subjected to change as we start to have SDF grid, but I've been using this for several years without problems, so I think it's already good enough. Another example is the center fall. In basic proximity fall, when you're using it as a point or others, the scale is consistent. In some procedural cases, you want a fall responding to your geometry size. And the center fall is a specific type of proximity fall that draws from the center to the boundary of a geometry. So no matter how my grid is changing its size, there is a spherical form being drawn and you can play with the animation factor just as the proximity. That's it. As I said, this is a kind of a very basic idea and there are actually more derivatives or concepts or animations using this uh, form. 
So I would like to pick it up and discuss it again. I hope you enjoy this tutorial. I'll probably see you next time. Bye-bye.